Good afternoon. My name is David Plausus. I'm the Opinion Engagement Editor for The Tennessean. And we have today another interview with the school board candidate. We're delighted to have Jeanette Carter here with us, who's mm -hmm. running for District 1 School Board for Nashville, and Frank Daniels, Metro Columnist and Editorial Board Member for the Tennessean Editorial Board. Welcome. Uh, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. And tell us a little bit about yourself and why you're running for this office. Okay. Well, my name is Jeanette Carter, and I am a 32-year educator, and I retired in 2006. I served as a teacher and also as an assistant principal and an executive principal at the Davidson County Juvenile Detention Center. And I am an advocate for the children of this community. I've been an advocate for over 32 years. Um, I bring a lot of experience and expertise to the board and I feel as though that I can enhance the board. I'm very capable of change and so uh, my expertise and my experiencing, experience will definitely help to enhance the board. And, and what motivated you to run for this? My gosh, I tell you, I started back in October of 2015. I thought about it, I got a group of individual close friends around me to have the discussion. And the number one thing is I prayed about it. And so I feel as though that this is something that God has led me to do. And so I'm retired, have plenty of time to, to work with that. And so I, I decided to do that then. Was there a precipitating event that cost you to? Oh yes, yes. Well, after working with the Davidson County Juvenile Detention Center, I saw those kids that came into the facility and I interviewed them every day, everyone that came into the facility. And as I sat and interviewed those kids and had an opportunity to look closely into their eyes, I had dialogue with them and I realized then that man, we have really lost our kids. Uh, they were just disconnected with the education system. But as they entered our facility, we were able to uh, do the things that Metro schools were offering. We were in collaboration with Metro schools. And so at that point in time, uh, we, I had teachers on staff that taught these students and we were just making leaps and bounds uh, with these individuals and, and we just really, you know, the thing of it is that these kids wanted to know that somebody cared about them. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you retired, for your last position was? Yes, I retired in 2006 after my husband passed and then I, I kind of sat around home and I said, oh my gosh. And, and all of a sudden, uh, this private company found out that I was retired. So they recruited me, mm -hmm. had me to come in and meet with the corporate management team. And so I decided to go to the facility because I, I just wanted to invest some time into those kids. What was your last position at, uh, in the school system? I was an assistant principal at White's Creek Comprehensive High School. Right. Uh, so you were, you were remarking on how we've lost these kids was and it's 10 years since you left White's Creek do you feel like there was a there's been a massive change in those 10 years is, uh, is that there has been a a, a, a big change uh, for some reason or another our kids are not uh, motivated to uh, have a sense of staying in school. Uh, they become frustrated for a lot of different reasons. <clears throat> These kids uh, come to Metro schools and they have a lot of mental health issues <clears throat> that they're dealing with. And so, you know, my take on that is that uh, we have not yet uh, had a sense of, of educating the total child. We've got to do that. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, those are the kind of things now, and as you well know, children have changed since we were in high school. You know, they've got all this new technology and all that kind of stuff, and, and they're just sort of, they're sort of different. Mm -hmm. They're sort of different. But, you know, again, at the uh, Davidson County uh, Detention Center, we were able to motivate kids, and even we had a kid to graduate from that facility, the first kid ever to graduate from that facility, yes. 
know, with your experience, it's, it's very interesting that there's a lot of discussion about youth violence and the oh, youth yes. discipline issues, and uh, we've had a discussion with at least another candidate about that being one of the reasons discipline why teachers mm -hmm. are leaving the system. Yes. Could you give us your perspective on that, how that's changed, and, and what kind of solutions you might bring to that? Well, discipline is a big concern of mine because teachers can't teach when they are dealing with the discipline issues all day long. And as a matter of fact, even with the state mandatory tests that, you know, they're expecting for these kids to pass, you know, they're not able to master that, especially when you have disruptions in the classroom. So my take on that is this. I feel as though that there, if there's disruptions going on in the school, we need to find out the reason why. And the reason why is that we need to create a profile and know really what's going on with this kid. These kids are coming to school and they're seeing everything uh, in the communities in which they live, in their homes. Uh, some of their parents do not value education, so, you know, they choose not to value. In having conversation with the kids at the detention center, you know, I would ask them, why? Why are you here? And so uh, the students would tell me, well, Miss Carter, uh, uh, there's no food at home. My mom or my dad is a, a drug addict. Uh, they're out on the street, and grandma is trying to raise me. So, you know, I committed these crimes to bring food to the table for my little brothers and sisters. And so, you know, a lot of this is happening, and we have got to find a way to uh, train our parents you know, and, and in hopes that this will sort of help our kids. Based upon what you've seen in the school board over the last few years, what do you think, if you were to name one thing that's going right with the school board, what would it be? And conversely, if there's something going wrong, what would it be? Well, <clears throat> there are nine members on the school board, and I just feel as though that uh, with the makeup of the nine team members, you need educators on the board that are, can make decisions about kids that are in with education. I think that uh, everybody loves the kids, but for some reason or another we have lost the focus. And the ultimate focus are the children. So, you know, I've seen those kind of things happen. So that would be in terms of what's going wrong, losing focus. What do you think is going right? Well, you know, I think that uh, a decision to hire Dr. Sean Joseph was a plus. I really think that with him coming on board is a plus for the city of Nashville. I truly think that he cares about kids. And so with him bringing the, those kind of dynamics to the city of Nashville and to the school district, I really feel that we're going to be able to move forward. So it sounds like your experience working with the uh, kids in the detention center has been very impactful on the way you see things. Um, <clears throat> in that experience, what, how would you apply that experience to creating policies that would change the outcomes that you think are uh, not happening? Yeah. Uh, with our children. As far as the policies, I think that we need to not have a policy in place across the board that 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 they're making that uh, uh, that more or less is used to uh, expel students from school. We need to look at each case individually. Now, if there is an issue within the schools where there's safety as far as other students and teachers, yes, we need to remove that child. But we need to look at individual cases uh, that are happening within the school system. So that is a, that's a policy that I think that needs to be changed. With regard to the role of the board member, you talked about the nine members. How do you see the role, if elected as a board member, how would you conduct yourself in terms of how, do, how involved would you be and how, um, how would you work with Dr. Joseph? Well, when elected, and I plan to be elected, is that I will be accountable. 
I will be responsive and receptive to the students, to the teachers, to the parents, and also to the community and the stakeholders that are involved. I feel as though that you need to get into the community to find out about issues that are going on in the community. And you need to listen thoughtfully and you need to act upon those respectfully. The, uh, Dr. Joseph has brought a new way of selecting leadership at the local school level mm -hmm. uh, with him uh, even before he started his job. You were an assistant uh, principal at White School, White School. High School, and, yes. Uh, what was your position in Hillsborough before that? I was a t classroom okay. teacher and also I was a girls basketball coach there, yes. So, uh, tell me how you think about this change in uh, how we're selecting principals works from your perspective as a yeah. former educator, yeah. former well, I've seen, I've seen this system put into place years ago because we had something similar here in Nashville. It was called site-based management where they involved uh, parents and the community in the selection process of the principals. And I think it's a great idea. I, I really think it's a great idea. Did it work well then? Uh, it worked good to a point uh, and, and up until when the politics got involved with it. Right. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that Dr. Joseph is going to allow that to happen. <laughs> uh, when, when, when was that that you, uh, you thought the politics began to get involved in cycling? Well, yeah. let's see. I was trying to think about the superintendent that the site-based manage management came under. It wasn't with Dr. Garcia. So Dr. Wise? Uh, yes, yes. And really the site-based management was a, a tool that started out in California. Mm -hmm. And for some reason or another, we tend to kind of latch on to those uh, uh, things that are happening in, in that part of the world, and we bring them here. So, uh, you know, it was a good thing as far as selection of principals because at that point in time, uh, it was good up until the politics started playing. Well, Dr. Joseph is uh, in 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 regard to dealing with politics. He's a, he made a reading a summer reading assignment to his the current board uh, called uh, Leadership and Self Deception. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you'd read that book yet. No, I have not read that book as of yet because you know when you're not in the inner loop, you don't know of those kind of things. But hey, I will go out and, and purchase that book. I will be aware. One of the things that Dr. Joseph had requested in his contract was a clause related to the way that the board communicated with him, that he communicated with them. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you see yourself as a team member in working with eight other members uh, in a constructive and productive way? Okay. Well, being a high school basketball coach, I know all about team play. Uh, I have uh, I served as a girls basketball coach at Hillsboro and also had some experience of working with Pat Summit and the Lady Vols at the University of Tennessee for 12 years in her summer camps. So, you know, I know about teamwork because I demanded that for my players. So I would definitely be a team player. And I know that I have a lot to offer the board. And how do you deal with offering critiques or criticism? Um, what, what is your style in terms of it? Because obviously there are going to be times when you may disagree with a particular decision, either Dr. Joseph or a particular vote. Um, how, uh, how, what is your approach? Well, I know how to disagree and be agreeable at the same time. So uh, that wouldn't be an issue. Uh, you know, I have to trust Dr. Joseph and his vision and the way in which he wants to move our district forward. So uh, I think that, you know, if there's major disagreement, we need to sit at the table and have some conversation about it. So your last two experiences within the system were at uh, Zone Schools. Yes. Uh, talk to me a little bit about what your thought is in, in terms of the choice process that has evolved over the last uh, 15 years. Yes. Uh, and uh, just your your thought process in terms of uh, where we're going as a district and are we going in the right direction? Well, I believe that parents should have a choice of where their uh, students are going to attend school because whatever works for that child, uh, the parents have got to make that decision, okay? But 
also, on the other hand, I, I feel as though that um, I, I'm, I think more or less you're speaking in terms of charter schools. Well, we have lots of different kinds of choices. Charters yes. could be, I mean, I, you, you can right. interpret choice the way you want to interpret right, it. Right, right, right. But I, I think that uh, parents need to have that choice of, of the kids and where they need to go to school because it is significantly important uh, for those kids. Uh, as far as uh, other aspects of, uh, of the school system, I do not believe in vouchers. Uh, I do not believe in that. And I also realize that uh, when kids are uh, in charter schools, uh, funds go with them. But if they are dismissed from charter schools, those funds stay there at that school. So I, I disagree with that from that aspect. Uh, then, you know, when you have kids that have IEPs and their individual education plans, uh, when the infrastructure do not have anyone there on staff to help take care of those situations, we have got to educate all the children and we've got to make sure that we're meeting their needs. And I think sometimes with that, we are pulling resources away from the public education system. Last week, the school board voted to sue the state of Tennessee for BEP uh, for, for the basic education program. Uh, what do you think about the decision, and how might you have approached that, that decision? And obviously, there was no discussion. That was obviously one thing that we've been discussing with other candidates. Mm -hmm. How might you have approached that, and, and would you tell us what you think about whether or not they should have done that? Well, right now, uh, as far as uh, me thinking whether or not that they should have done that, I'm still doing my research on that. Uh, I do know that BEP funds, they were in place when I was in school, and those are funds that they give the teachers to buy extra materials and resources that they need in the classroom. I do understand that there are sm small district counties around Davidson County that are involved in that as well. So I am still doing my research on that. So um, the uh BEP actually pays for uh, teacher salaries too. I mean, it's a very comprehensive. Yes. Oh yes. Oh yes. Oh yes. Oh yes. 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 It does. And uh, different district has uh, different salary ranges as far as their teachers are concerned. So you know, I, I really feel that if teachers deserve this, then you need to make sure that you're giving that info that that those funds to those teachers. Okay. Across the board. The, one of the um, questions that we're asking uh, each of the candidates is um, uh, a little bit different than what David talked about. He talked about from the board perspective. But what are the, what do you think that uh, metro schools are? The one thing that you think metro schools are doing well and should not should just not stop doing. Well, I really feel that Metro schools are, are, are doing great. I mean, uh, we're not at the bottom. And so we're doing some good things in, in Metro schools. I, I feel as though the literacy program is a program that is working extremely well within the school system. I feel as though that our uh, honors classes and AP classes are on the rise. And also with our, our magnet schools, which is Martin Luther King and Hume Fogg, that are here in Nashville, I think that we should institute the same kind of curriculum, the same base of teachers in all the schools across the board. We should have more than just Martin Luther King and Human Fall. Make all the schools equal to that. So conversely, what's the, what's the one thing that if you could change it today that you would change about how Metro Schools operates? Well, I guess my concern would be students first. We've got to address the students first. And I, I don't think that we have did that. And uh, the students are just more or less just, have been kind of pushed to the side. And you know, uh, we've got to reach out and actually uh, 
pull these students in. Uh, you know, teachers don't have a job if, if students are not there. We've got to increase our graduation rate. Uh, we've got to just, you know, I'm just old school and, and I thoroughly believe and I am just passionate about the students first and that is a part of my platform. I, I, I'm a little bit confused, but I mean, I certainly yeah. understand by saying students first. Is there an example of one thing that you would do that would change that your perception of that we're not putting students first? Well, our students are uh, just like the rule that, that they have in Metro, uh, whereas that now the teachers have to give the students 50 uh, and, and, and nothing anything lower than that, I, I think that's absurd. You know, I, I, I just really feel that uh, we've got to get in there and dig deep and teach and we've got to uh, hold teachers accountable and we have got to make sure that we're, we are retaining uh, quality teachers. And I think that, uh, you know, we're losing teachers because of the evaluation piece, whereas the uh, teachers are uh, based on whether they're a good or bad teachers uh, because of the testing that's done. But we haven't taken into consideration the mindset of those kids when they come in to take those tests. Right. So uh, we've got to go back and look at that, and we've got to rethink that piece. You know, as we discuss the issue of um, students and, and, and poverty, and, and uh, you had mentioned adverse childhood experiences without actually mentioning that, but um, one of the issues that we've been focusing on is that Tennessee has been mobility, which has been defined as students leaving for a reason other than grade promotion. So typically it's been for economic reasons. Mm -hmm. How did you encounter that in your teaching and student leadership career? And do you have any ideas for addressing the mobility rate, which is currently 35% mm -hmm. here in Metro National Public Schools? Yes. Well, uh, we need to do some restorations and we have got to uh, be able to have situations where kids are feeling welcome in the school system. They, and they do at some situations, but we've got to draw those kids back in. We've got to find a way to draw those kids back in. We are losing a lot of kids. They're dropping out of school. And, and a lot of the kids that were in the Davidson County uh, facility, they were academically behind. You know, they were 16, 17 years of age and uh, in the ninth grade. Uh, we've got to find a way to grasp these kids. You know, I, I'm just passionate about the kids, guys. N you know, really, all of the other stuff is great and good, but if we do not find a way to reach these kids, uh, we're in trouble. Were there any examples of successful approaches to at least reaching some of these kids that you've, that you've seen or that have impressed you? We've got to, we've got to show the kids that we truly care about them. And I, I'm not saying that, uh, you know, teachers don't care, but, you know, we have got to just find a way to connect to these kids. Um, I've seen kids in the Davidson County Juvenile Detention Center. I've seen kids at the school levels that were just struggling academically and they were just struggling just to just to be there right you know just to be there how did you when you were an educator an active educator address try to connect with these kids oh there were times that you know I gave lunch money there was time that about uh, uniforms uh, uh, there were times that I just set a kid down and talked to them and had that conversation piece with them and uh, I think that they uh, really knew that I, I cared about their total well-being. So just having that conversation with these kids. So uh, looping back to your comment about uh, not giving zeros yeah. to, to kids, uh, in effect creating uh, or perpetuating a social promotion mm -hmm. uh, uh, 
policy. Mm -hmm. it, it, is, do you think that that um, is part of not caring about kids? No, I don't think that's a part of not caring about kids, but I'm saying that, you know, that gives kids no motivation for those kids that are struggling academically. Well, these kids are smart. They look at that 50, well, all I need to do is make a, uh, you know, I'm going to get a 50 given to me, so all I have to do is just this much. Mm -hmm. to to pass and to uh, make the grade that's necessary for me to be a, promoted on to the next grade. I, I just think that uh, uh, that is not a motivator for kids. So it creates a, uh, a system of low expectations? Yes, low expectations, you, yes. Is it then your thought process or your philosophy that um, the kids will uh, if you have low expectations, they'll meet them, and if you have high expectations, Some kids, meet. some kids, and it's based on some kids. Some kids, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, they would. Are there aspects of the, uh, you know, some of the areas where the school board can be very effective at removing policies through the strategic plan, through its interactions with the superintendent, and obviously through the budget, are there aspects where you'd like to see that process improve or where you'd like to add or adapt any of those elements, you know, whether it's it's adjusting the strategic plan that we currently have, or whether it's giving emphasis to certain things. So, for example, there's been a lot of emphasis on English language learner mm -hmm. education here. Mm -hmm. But for your own vision, if you could talk to us a little bit about that, about how you would use your power as a school board member to influence change. Uh, the context of this is Dr. Joseph, even though he hasn't officially started, mm -hmm. has still made a series of decisions that Frank had alluded to, such as the principal's decision. Mm -hmm. But he sent out a memo today talking about his transition, that is, how is this going to happen? And it's, there's a great sense of urgency, that word urgency is being used constantly. Uh, but in terms of, of, of actively pursuing the powers of the school board, what, what would be your vision for that? Well, I have, as, as uh, working with Trevecca University, I had an opportunity there to serve as a mentor for teachers, uh, graduate student teachers that were pursuing education. And one of the uh, teachers that I had taught ELL. And I had an opportunity to sit in her class. And, you know, um, the students uh, that were in her class were uh, intelligent kids. Uh, they were trying to learn the English language. And most of them spoke English, really. Uh, but as far as the strategic plan, I think that whatever that Dr. Joseph puts into place, uh, we have got to find a way to support, the, support his efforts. And I really, at this point in time, uh, have not even investigated that. I didn't even know that came out in the paper today. Uh, so, just this afternoon, so oh, it's okay. Online, so it it's online. Been, okay, yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, I read the paper. Uh, I have to have a paper in my hand. Sure. I don't do a lot of online reading of the newspaper, but uh, I would support his well, efforts. I'm glad you, you read the print. That's the yes, <laughs> I miss that print. I, you know, I I do take the paper. Um, can you t can you tell us about the person you admire and why? Hmm. Mm -hmm. I admire my grandmother, my great-grandmother. And the reason why that I admire her is because when I was young, as a, uh, a three-year-old, uh, I had experiences like some of these kids that are in Metro School. My mother was very young, and at that time, uh, uh, she was a little uh, disconnected as far as raising two children and my grandmother uh, decided to help out and take me and, and raise me. So I admire everything that she instilled in me from the uh, values and from the education piece and uh, all of those things. It would be my grandma, my great grandmother. And her name is Hattie Walker. And as a matter of fact, she was 97 years of age when she passed. And my grandmother was 101. So I have longevity. <laughs> good genes. Yes, good genes, good genes. How closely have you been following the student-based uh, budgeting 
initiative that uh, interim director Chris Henson has been talking about? And I haven't been following that. You know, uh, this campaign thing is so new to me that I have just been so engrossed with all of that. But. Uh, you know, I, I do plan to sit down and, and, and look at those issues. I know that that is a part of my job and my responsibility when I become a board member. And how, how, what is a typical campaign day like? Oh man, a campaign day. It starts for me in the morning and uh, my scheduler sometimes overbook me and I am running to events at least maybe two or three hours apart and ends at night around 9.30. Uh, I was talking to Craig last night and at 11.30 I was out delivering materials. So uh, it is uh, something that's keeping me going, keeping me young, and uh, so I am moving forward with that and uh, it's busy. It's so busy, but it's good. What have, you, what have you learned from the campaign process and from the voters that you've been talking to? Well, the voters that I have been talking to have been very, very supportive of me uh, because, uh, you know, they pretty much know me. I have gone into the Jolton community and was well received there with the constituents there in Jolton. And I think that they really realize and know that I'm working hard and that I'm going to be a person that's going to come back into the community and give to the community. And I'm going to be able to inform them of issues and also listen to their concerns. So uh, that has been the biggest piece for me with my campaign. Uh, I'm open to listening and um, it's, just, it's just moving me forward. I tell you, I've just been blessed. I stepped out on faith, did not have a lot of money, but uh, God has provided me with everything that I needed thus far. So if you've been up in the Jolton community, what have, uh, what have you heard in terms of their reaction to the process last year when they were going through um, uh, the prospect of their school becoming a, a ASD school, an right. achievement school, district yes. school, yes. And, and have they demanded that you do take a particular stand on uh, the Achievement School District going forward? They have not, and, and as a matter of fact, they have not even discussed that at all. Uh, we've just had conversation of who I am, and ex as far as they're concerned, they want to make sure that I am going to represent their community. Are, are there specific issues that they bring up to you? No, they really haven't brought up any really specific information except that they want me to be accessible to their community because uh, they have not more or less uh, interacted with my incumbent in their community. And so, you know, and, and one of my parents said, well, at least you're coming into our community to meet us. And so they're very supportive. So is that part of the impetus to run is because there's the perception that uh, that uh, Dr. Gentry is not accessible? Yes, 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 yes. It is. It is. It is uh, the, uh, one of the reasons why I decided to run. Okay. Well, we are getting close to the end of the interview, but is there anything that you'd like to add that we haven't discussed? No. Let's see. I just know that I'm a 32-year educator. I bring a lot of experience and expertise to the board and I believe in serving people and I know that I would be a great person to serve on the board and uh, that's just where I am right now. I'm just moving forward and I've already claimed it and so uh, you know my heart is again I keep saying kids my heart is, is for the kids and for this community, and so I will be accountable to them. Is there any uh, contact information you'd like to share with our audience? Yes, okay. You can go to my website at www.JeanetteCarterForSchoolBoard, and you can check my website out there. Is that a .com or .org? Sorry. .com. Dot com. So say that one more time. www.jeanettecarter, www and that's J-A-N-E-T-T-E, -T -T -E, Carter, 
for schoolboard.com, and that's F-O-R. I didn't put the little short for in there, F-O-R. <laughs> well, very good. Well, we want to thank you so much for taking the time to meet with us. This is a great public service. We thank you so much. And to our readers at Tennessean.com, we hope you'll continue to join us for the next week and a half. We still have eight more uh, school board candidates. Make sure that you are registered to vote. And to make sure that I don't get this wrong, it's August 4th. Correct. August 4th is the election for school board. Uh, make sure to vote. Thank you very much.